everyone. Welcome back to the Capsuling Conversation. I'm Natalie Anderson, and on today's final episode of the series, I'm joined by my most special guest so far, our human bookaroo, naughty nana, and acclaimed account manager, Deborah Clark, aka my mum, as we talk aging, acceptance, and everything else in between in this Mother's Day special. So as it's Mother's Day, pour the wine, clear the room, Get ready to join in with our conversation. Everybody, um, thank you so much for joining us on this Mother's Day special episode of In Conversation. We hope you've all had a wonderful day, especially in these very uncertain times. And with everything that's going on at the minute, it's not quite the episode I'd planned. However, in terms of anxiety and stress, who better to have with me in the studio today than my mum? Hello, Debs. Hi, everybody. Hi, ah, are you excited? Yeah, I'm a bit nervous. <laughs> oh, don't be nervous, <laughs> bless her. Um, now, before we crack on, mum, because let's face it, I mean, you and me could talk for England, I just wanted to give a big shout out to our fabulous fashion editor, Anna Muse, and our gorgeous girl about, Lindsay Thomas. We hope you're having a beautiful Mother's Day. Don't we, Mum? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. (laughs) Right, well, back to you, Mum. You've worked in the beauty and retail industry for over 20 years, heading up accounts of a number of notable luxury beauty brands. You've mentored a plethora of young employees who've all gone on to have successful careers with your training. You've been the naughtiest nana to Freddie for seven years. And finally, the best mum to me for 38. Oh, (laughs) don't This is me and my mum all over. We just always like get a bit teary. You've overcome many struggles and challenges, including single parenthood, financial hardship and divorce, but have always remained a practical tower of strength to our family. Debs, how do you do it? (laughs) Oh my God. It's just life. It's just, it's just life the way it is, isn't it? I mean, I wouldn't say that. I just say just knuckle down and get on with it to be honest but you do though don't you I mean like when we're, when I think about all the things that we've been through together it's a you blow my mind really because I'm like oh my god how did my mum get through that how's my mum got through just everything I mean if we go back to the beginning like you had me at 17 that is so young I know. what what was that like being a mum at 17 um well to be honest it was a shock to be honest um you know, just not long out of school, planning what we're going to do. And then all of a sudden I'm having a baby. But there was never any doubt that that was my journey. I was going to be a mum and hopefully a good mum. And um, as I say, you know, 17 years old, and I thought, well, this is it. You know, my life is no longer going to be about just me, which is really good, really. And, And I have to say, Natalie, and I know we've had this conversation many, many times, but people ask you throughout your life you know what's your achievements and having a daughter like you and the way you are and who you are will get a bit tearful here <laughs> that is my achievement because that I don't think there's any job in this world that's harder and I think you're finding that out now yourself oh really. god yeah it is it's so hard it's such a responsibility it really truly is you know and to have that at such a young age, I think I learned very, very quickly. I really grew up very quickly. Um, and Yeah, I, I wouldn't change a thing, to be honest. I absolutely wouldn't change a thing. In fact, if anything, I can sort of sit back a bit now and think, right, well, <laughs> no, but you do. No, absolutely. You do kind of, <sighs> like you've said before, we've had this conversation where I've been like oh my god mum just leave me alone or you know like I remember vividly when I went off to university and my mum being hysterical crying sorry mum it's true though I know you were and I remember looking at you going oh Debs what's up with you like what's the matter with you and then you fast forward now it's like me being a mum with Fred and and I think I've said it to you, haven't I? Mum, yeah, I'm were. so sorry. I'm so sorry. I was so unreasonable. I'm so sorry. I didn't understand. I just never truly understand the weight of what being a mum actually was. And and for me, it does blow my mind that I think, crikey, you had that at 17 years old. Like I was doing my A-levels. I was just off doing stuff. To have that amount of responsibility um, out there, you know, 
on on your shoulders at such a young age and as well the other thing is it's not like it's not like we lived in the lap of luxury you know we had yeah. a really hard time but to be fair Natalie I think things have changed an awful lot over the last 20 years anyway I mean when I was a child when I was Freddie's age I wasn't really seven you know right from your grandma's age you know children in the family learned to do things very quickly so you, you were kind of quite domesticated helping out with the washing up and helping out with your siblings even when you were younger so I suppose for you to imagine being a mum at 17 is like oh my god but for me I'm not saying I'm ready to be a mum at 17 but I certainly wasn't oh my god how do you boil an egg because we knew we knew <laughs> all can't. of that no but we did <laughs> We had to all muck in and help out anyway, so I felt a lot older than 17, if you know what mm. I mean. You know, when I was going out with your dad from being sort of 14, 15, so by the time we were They were 17, young lovers and they went to, they did disco competitions. Went to Northern Soul. <laughs> <laughs> but, by, <laughs> but by the time we were 17, it felt like we'd been going out together forever. So it was quite a a long well-established relationship you know so it, it didn't kind of like oh god she's having a baby at 17 it was yeah. we felt quite old actually <laughs> even then it's funny because like yeah I suppose I suppose yeah in those days you know 17 was a lot more grown up I think nowadays you know it's it's kind of 30 before we well, start yeah. to grow up and you know and kind of have it getting it together and mature we seem to be younger for for a lot for longer for longer well, does that irritate you with no, people just, you're like, no. <laughs> but sometimes I do think oh, for god's sake you know what's wrong with you you know I get a lot of the young girls I work with a lot of young girls and they're all wonderful and they're beautiful they're absolutely I look at them and think oh wow but to be honest I do think to some of them god you would have no chance you know, they're like, how do you do this, Debs? And it's like, oh, for God's sake, I'll bring a baby up at 17. And it is, it's funny because I just think, God, you know, I think we mod mollycoddle kids a lot more these days. I think we want to keep them at home. I would have done the same if I'd have had a chance. <laughs> uh, Deborah, I'm just looking at you now going, oh, we mod mollycoddle kids um, and you're a very um, hands-on nana. You mollycoddle yeah, our son terribly. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I, do. I like it. <laughs> No, but I'm tough with him as well. Yeah, you are tough. I've got a nice balance there. But I do like to do things for Fred. Yeah, I do. And I like to do things for you, but no. you're quite independent, so it's a bit harder. Yeah, very. Um, going back to that, as I said, when we were younger, um, you know, it was it was difficult. We lived in a tiny little flat. It was, for most of the time, you and I um, in that one bedroom, two bedroom flat. And uh, yeah, and, you know, we didn't have everything I mean you worked like what two jobs three jobs at any one so, time yeah two sometimes three depending I mean again like how was that well again really hard and the, the difficulty is without wanting to apportion blame here oh this is your fault I had to do this you know mm. I just felt at that time I had to be mum and dad mm. to be honest um, and all the other kids had this that and the other so as a parent yeah you do want your children to sort of fit in and have like you're feeling that now you want them to fit in you want them to have what the other kids have got and so in order to get those things yeah you did need to sort of like sometimes work three jobs to make a full-time wage really um so yeah it was hard and and you do carry quite a lot of guilt about not spending that quality time well I do with you as a child mm. um and it's just something you have to sort of live with and get used to really it is so I suppose like mum guilt has been because obviously we talk about that a lot now in the media you know mum guilt oh, mum, mum's going back to work you know mm. after they've had kids and they've got careers and everything I suppose even then like back in the early 80s you know that was something that you you dealt with on oh a daily God, basis massively massively because you know and luckily I had brought your nana and your granddad to come and help me so that that was quite nice that's why I'm such a hands-on nana as well because I think well, you know, I, I had my family to sort of rely on, so that made it feel slightly less worse that you were with a, a family member. But at the same time, you can't compensate for the fact that it's not you that's with your child daily. Um, you know, hence when I changed from my working in a restaurant, which I did, which was nice and convenient for your schooling, when you started asking me, <laughs> Mom, why do you always go to work when I come home from school? That was like, oh, my God, major which obviously prompted me then to go change direction and, and go to work during the day so I could be home with you on an evening, which is obviously where I started my retail career, really. Mm. And that's where, you know, so it's all down to you, Natalie, where <laughs> I've ended up where I am. Well, you see, there we are. <laughs> um, talking about where you are now, because... Um, 
you've worked in, although it's been retail, predominantly beauty for so long and have you know built up an incredible reputation amongst your peers and and the people that you work with and the brands that we're not allowed to talk about but some really good ones oh, sure. <laughs> um, um you know um you've you've um, you've kind of built yourself up and built this reputation um as somebody that can be trusted and somebody that manages people really well what do you think um is necessary in management what what skills do you need to be able to manage people but you know, Nasla, we had this conversation with somebody the other day, one of the young girls I'm working with, and we chatted about being a manager. And I said, you know, what does being a manager mean to you? And she actually said, oh, you know, looking after the business, doing all the figures, doing the paperwork. That's what I think, you know, managing your business is. And I said, no, that's just the really small part of it. I said, Man- being a manager is about people. It will always be about people. Um, because the thing is, You know, we're only as good as our team, really, but it's about how to get the best out of people, how to motivate, how to see things in people. You know, you look at somebody and you think, yeah, you've got qualities. You know, everybody brings something different to the team, to the table. So it's about identifying that in individual people. Some people are quiet and shy, but they, you know, they shine in other ways. Some people are flamboyant. And I think I've got that real perception of, I can read people really well. I know whether people are wanting to get on or not really that bothered or not motivated. So I think that's what helps me is to to really get down and treat every single person as an individual and work at their level and work how they want to work. So, you know, we don't like to call it training. We like to call it sort of coaching and mentoring really, but mm. it is about an individual and it is about trust and it's about believing in people and inspiring them. Do you think as well that, um, again, not discrediting anyone out there that's that's not a mum or or, um, it, or anything, but do you think that because you're a mum and it's, and you do work with a lot of young women that you, yeah. you have you take on a maternal role with oh, them? Massively. Because that's what I've always found is that when whenever I've come across the, the young women that you've worked with and the, the way that they respond to you, it's a bit like you're their mum, and I'm like, I whoa, am, yeah. <laughs> Whoa, no, back off, <laughs> she's mine. <laughs> I get called Mama Debs, Mama all the time, really, because, yeah, you're absolutely right. And I think within my industry, with the people I've worked with and worked for, I think they would all agree that I do have quite a maternal influence over the people I work with. And I think, yeah, to some degree, I think they go kind of hand in hand, especially with younger people. Mm. Absolutely, because, again, I feel like, you know what I'm like, Natalie. I've said it to you all your life. You can be anything you want to be if you put your mind to it. You know, nobody's going to bring it to you and drop it on your doorstep. You know, the world is your oyster if you want to take yourself fishing. You know, you can't expect somebody to turn around and go, oh, there you go. Mm. You work hard. You go out there. You make what you want. And if you believe in yourself enough, you know, you will make things happen. You do make things happen. Um, and yeah, a lot of the younger people I work with, sometimes I think maybe they've missed that encouragement or nobody's actually bothered to find out what makes them tick or, you know, what they want. And it's it's really quite key, really. But yeah, I do think I do mother them over a bit. And I think that makes a nice balance because they know I care. Yeah, definitely. And and like you say, but there's also that respect, you know, just like you would with, um, well, she's laughing, she's yeah, yeah. Laughing, at me, <laughs> laughing at me because she's thinking, you've got none for me. No, you <laughs> no I'm joking. You I do, I do. I just, you know, we're, we're very strong minded, me and my mum. Um, this is good getting us in a room together for this long. <laughs> Yeah, no. I'm joking. But um, I do think because there is that respect, you know, as you should respect your parents and grandparents, um, and it's not just that kind of manager where you're afraid of them and, and they're like, you know, take advantage of their position. You are very parental in, in the way that you're in the style that you manage as well, because I've seen it from my own mm. my own perspective and and I do think that you you get the best out of out of your um team and they all say that about you as well I mean which must be really nice do you, is it that... is nice I mean I had I, I had a, a manager one of my very first managers a lovely lady called Christine she she was like that she was just like that with me when I was sort of like in my 20s and you were a little girl and I remember really looking up to her and thinking oh my god you're so amazing because she's so firm and she'd make your hair stand on end if she were that way out and you did something but yeah she was so fair with you as well you know she'd go out of her way to do things for you and I used to think oh if I were I'm a manager I want to be like that 
I want to, you know, we're all inspired by somebody. Yeah. And I used to think, I want to be like that because, you know, if I, if, if it's very much give and take, you know, you, you know, you give and you take and it's the same, you know, you've got to be equals, you've got to be on an equal footing really. And it's the same. I find that most colleagues that I have that are what I deem to be good managers, they kind of follow the same rule really. You know, you, you, you're fair in, that when you need to be but sometimes you also have to make sure that things are firm because we are running a business we are managing people we do have to keep things as they are but I think people respond to that most Mm. people like structure and most people like rules you know to a degree there's bending the rules and I don't know maybe chewing some chewing gum when you're not supposed to be but we can sort of get away with that to a degree but then there's other things and I think it's like being a not being a child but it is you know your rules and you know your limitations, really, and you just don't push it. Mm. So I think that's where that comes into it. But yeah, I am Mama Debs at work. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, obviously, it, it, beauty wasn't what you always wanted to do. Um, when you were at school, what what did you want to do? Do you know what? I have absolutely no idea. Really? No. I think back then, when I was a child at school, I think everybody wanted to be an aerostess. You know, everybody wanted to be either a hairdresser or a hair roastess. Um Yeah, I think it... I think you didn't even, you didn't no. like, that's so weird. I never knew that. I always thought you wanted to do like teaching or something like no. that. No, I think you only want to do things like teaching when you get older and you know how important it is. Not like me. I was like obviously wanting to hop, skip and dance around at like five. No, but that's different because if, yeah, I'd like to hop, skip and dance around as well. I were always <laughs> wanting to dress up and be on a stage and stuff like that but not f- not for a career that was just a dead daydream for me but no when I were in school the, the sort of glamorous job would be oh if I could be an air hostess because that's how it was painted then or yeah. a hairdresser so I started off I worked in a hairdresser actually in Sat- a Saturday yeah. mornings £2.50 for all, well it wasn't even Saturday morning it were all day Saturday <laughs> me and my best friend £2.50 we got paid for working in hairdressers what did you do? Well, we we passed up the rollers, we swept up the hair, we cleaned the mirrors, we passed the perm solution. That's yeah, so weird. It was like fashioned. what one of my first jobs was. Obviously, working for my dad. My dad was a hairdresser in the in the nineteen nineties, and he had his own salon. And that's so strange. I never knew that that's what you did. Yeah, we're about fourteen. I think I said I was sixteen. <laughs> I wanted some pocket money. <laughs> um, well, g- going back to then beauty, um, because. I just wanted to ask you about um, beauty in midlife because obviously my mum is in. Are we allowed to say that? Yes, mom? you can we say, can it's say it. Fine. Are we allowed to say what your actual age is? Yeah. Yeah. Well, now I'm going, what's her actual age? <laughs> 56. I shall be 57 this you year. You shall be 57 this year, my mum. But, you know, you work and you, you run counters and you do people's makeup and everything. What's the most common concern that people come to you with? Particularly in, in mid... Sort of, yeah, yeah, sort of our age. So, the, so around the eyes, really, people do come and start to say, oh, I'm getting quite liney around the eyes and, you know, I want to... Some people want to wear makeup, some mm. people don't. Um, and the ladies that do, then they will struggle with sort of like, you know, how, how can I make my eyelids look better? They're quite crepey. I've got hooded eyes, which I do too, to be honest, so I can see all the struggles there. Um some people just want to look, um, in fact, more so lately, people are looking to have more of a, a brighter, dewy complexion, which is something we always in- encourage for more mature ladies because it does, it makes the skin look quite quite vibrant, really, quite alive. Um, you know, a lot. the thing what happens with a lot of ladies um, is they get set in their ways of, I've always done my makeup this way, so this mm. is the way I'll always do it. Or they don't really understand the differences in, so, for example, foundations and finishes, you know, if you start off using um, certain branded makeup and then go over the top of it with a powder because mm-hmm. you think oh, that's what you have to do, then that's what you continue to do for years and years and years. And it's still got the same matte look to it. Mm. Whereas as you get older, you might want to have a complexion that's quite dewy. You know, we're all looking at visuals and images on on walls of beautiful women and older women with glowing skin. You think, oh, she got that glowing skin. <laughs> How she got that look, you know, and, and you know, great skincare. I mean, a great advocate for looking after your skin anyway, but great skincare, but then a really lovely sort of dewy finish foundation. You can also get really fine particle pa- finishing powders that have got a, like a nice glow to them. 
So they're all little tricks of the trade that can make people really feel quite youthful. Um, you know, as I said earlier, I'm a, I'm a great advocate of having that dewy look to the skin because it doesn't matter how old you are, if your skin looks fresh, you look older and mm. fresh. I quite like being mature, to be honest. Do you, Mum? Yeah, I do. I don't mind. I absolutely don't mind my age whatsoever. Tell Sometimes, me why. I just don't because I just, well, I think as well because I'm your mum. <laughs> well, I look at you and I think, well, Natalie's 38. Am I allowed to say your age? Yes, you are, Debs. <laughs> um, and I'm her mum, so I shouldn't look like Natalie looks. I should look older than her and I should look like a mum. Um, so I quite, and I've always thought that really, to be honest, right through our, our lives together, I've always thought I should look at least 20 years older than my daughter. I don't want to compete. I don't want to look the same. I want to look like I'm your mum. Mm. Do you know? And it's just something that, that's in me, really. Well, something that I've always said about you is, and, and I think you've just demonstrated it there, is that you have such a positive attitude towards ageing and your body. I know you sometimes have the odd complaint, but there's never been a time in my life as a young woman growing up that I remember you going, being really negative on yourself and having like a negative image of yourself. And that was for me growing up, you know, we, you've always in, encouraged lovely family meals. There's never been like diets banded about or anything like that. It's always. I can't do them. You know, <laughs> I'm so rubbish. <laughs> no, but what I mean is though, it's it's for me growing up. There's I've never really heard you talk in that kind of language, and maybe it's because you can't do. It. I am. I'm rubbish. I'm not that strict. I just I just can't. I mean, this is no disrespect to people out there who really are, you know, dedicated to what they do. They've got these. I mean, yeah. Let's look at Jennifer Lopez. I saw Natalie actually put a picture up not long ago. Some fifty year old women looking amazing, and I thought oh my God, look at her, she's fabulous. And I thought, yeah, but I'm too lazy. I'm too lazy to be like Jennifer Lopez, I'm sorry. You can look amazing, you know, you're getting paid a fortune to be up there dancing about at 50 odd, but you know what, I'm just too lazy. But I don't think it'll feel like you've ever kind of beat yourself up about it though either. Well, no. Where does that come from? I don't know really, I just, I don't know, I'm just happy, I'm quite simple really, I'm quite simple in life. I think if I can get into my clothes, I'm all right. I do get a bit worried when I can't and I go on these mad whims of filling my window ledge with fruit, which I've been showing my girls at work. Look at my window ledge, it's full of fresh fruit. <laughs> it's like Jamie Oliver's window ledge. But um, yeah, I have a go for a couple of weeks and then, I, and then I think, oh, I can't do it. Do you think, though, that comes then from um, just being confident in yourself? Because yeah, I know that you do struggle now and again with confidence. Like even coming in today, you were like, oh my God, oh my God. And you were nervous. But in terms of an an inner, I always think this about you. It's like you've got this inner um, being that's just you know what I think it confident. is? I'm happy with myself. I'm happy with my, the company I keep. Um, and I suppose what you've just said there, Natalie, is coming on, on uh, in conversation with today, I'm thinking... Well, I'm comfortable in my own little world, I suppose. So putting myself out into a bigger world, it's like, oh, opening yourself up to criticism. And it's not that I'm bothered about that, but I'm, I don't particularly want it because I'm not inviting anybody to criticise me. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So I think, well, that's how I think. I think, well, you know, the people in my world, yes, it matters to me what they think of me because they're the chosen people that are in my world. And everybody else, you know, can whistle Dixie, really. <laughs> You know, that's sure how I feel. Say something else then. No, no. <laughs> but that's how I feel. I just feel like I'm not opening myself up to sort of asking for other people's opinions on but me. But what I mean is, even when you were young, though, I mean, to be fair, you did look drop dead gorgeous, and you do look lovely now, Mum. But what I'm oh, saying gosh. is that, Eve, I just don't remember. I don't ever remember you having any thought. Like nowadays, obviously, it's 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 everywhere people being negative about themselves I don't remember growing up with you and maybe I, I'm, I'm wondering was that a conscious effort because you were bringing up a daughter or just didn't act, you didn't even enter your head about the way you looked I just don't think I think we all as women we all want to look nice we all want to look in the mirror and we all want to think oh yeah look okay um I've never been overly critical because I don't suppose it's do you know what I like I like nice people mm. I I admire people, interesting people. And, you know, if you were in a room having a conversation with a group of people, yeah, you might be drawn to a really beautiful woman and think, oh, God, she's so gorgeous. You can't stop looking at her. 
But if somebody was making you laugh and, you know, having a great conversation and your chances are you would be veering towards that person and they would be holding your attention, not the beautiful one. So I suppose really I've always liked to be the person who has a bit of a laugh and a joke, has a tale to tell and, you know, I find people like that more interesting. I always would prefer to be seen as, oh, Debbie, she's great company and funny than, oh, Debbie, yeah, let's go spend the night with her because she's pretty. Mm. So I don't think it's ever really been that important to me. Um, I think inner confidence should be more paramount than what we look like on the outside, really. Yeah, I, I mean, I completely agree with you. And, 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 you know, on this particular show, we talk about that a lot. We talk about, you know, empowerment and building people up and making people feel proud of their achievements. And that's how they can really shine and, you know, not not looking at kind of what people do look like. But obviously, you know, there does come a point where you do want to feel your best and you do, mm. you know, you do want to look nice because it, it, that does make you feel better in in your um industry what do you like most about working in beauty right so this is what i was just going to say to you um so going back to what i've just said about not having to look young and pretty if you are a lady of a certain age and you know you, you you're not happy with how you actually look there are so many simple things that we can do and show you how to do yourself to to make yourself feel better when you look at yourself. It's like me personally, I don't particularly like wearing lots of eyeshadow. I've got hooded eyelids and I think, mm, don't sit right on me. So just to put a smaller amount on the, the mobile lid or the bit, that, you know, your eyelid, it can look really lovely. So there's things like that, that we sit ladies down, we do like lessons with them, we show them how to make the best of who they are, not mm. transform them into somebody else. You know, not kind of completely change how they look with makeup, but use the makeup to en enhance what they've got naturally. Mm. And they're still themselves. Yeah. You know, it's like when you get young brides coming in for their bridal makeup. There's nothing worse than coming for a bridal makeover. And the girl who's doing your makeup completely changes you into somebody else completely, like Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. It's like, well, I'm getting married. So, you know, what we really should be doing is encouraging people to use makeup products to really enhance what they've already got. Mm. You know, more mature ladies, if they've got a few fine lines on the skin, yeah, go for something a little bit more dewy. So it's more like reflective, so it looks more flattering. Skin looks more radiant. And just simple changes like that, it's amazing to see the difference in how somebody keeps looking at themselves in the mirror. Oh, do you, do you enjoy yeah, that bit? Yeah, You think, oh, oh my God, they look and think, oh my God, look at me. That's the nicest part about our job. It really, truly is. Or oh, getting past that barrier where, you know, for the for longest time now, um, ladies have found the beauty hall a very intimidating place to go. Mm. You know, chances are most of the ladies that are going to look after you are beautiful, they're young, they're stunning, uh, they've got full face of makeup on they've got a prestigious gorgeous uniform they stand there and you think oh my god I'm not talking to her and you know they're in reality they're all really lovely girls they're all just like you know you and me we've all got the same issue the same problems they all you know sit down on the morning put the face on and cover up the spots and cover up the dark circles just like everybody else does and I think for ladies out there you know if you do have that kind of feeling about oh don't ask please do you know, just come in and please do ask because take a seat. Obviously, at the minute, it's a slightly different yeah, obviously. Uh, for all of us. But generally speaking, you know, your beauty hall is a really nice place to sort of come and take a seat and play around. And have a chat. Have a chat. That's the one thing that everybody always says about you. Oh, yeah, Debs. Oh, yeah, I know her. <laughs> Can't tell you how many people chat about all sorts. But that's what's lovely about it, really. It's you're getting to know your clients. You, the, you know, you're building up that trust, and and it is really you've got to be very genuine in our industry. You've got to be. Mm. You've got to want to do what's right for your ladies. That's going to really make them feel special about themselves, and 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 get that inner confidence, especially when they're getting older. I think that is something that you know does sometimes get overlooked. Is just how much um, your particular industry does um, make people feel better about themselves. And like you say, you are genuine. You know, you do want the best for um, your clients. Well, you in particular do, and I think that's probably mm. why you why people come back to you so often. Um, just changing things slightly differently now. We're going in a slightly different direction. You're going to kill me for this conversation now. Oh God, <laughs> well, I, because again, we've talked about the fact, you know, you are 56 and um, 
it is the time of, of the menopause. I've been talking about this for a good few weeks now about how I personally feel like there needs to be more education around it starting a lot younger. And part of my part of my thinking of that is is our journey together through it because I'll be honest, I've been so impatient with my mum over the last few years. I found it really difficult. I found it, I feel like I don't know who she is. I feel like she's kept moaning and I don't know why. And then she's <laughs> telling me, no, I'll be brutally honest. And, and she's going, well, I can't see this. And then she, something changes and then she can see it and then she can't. And I'm like, what's the matter with you? <laughs> and I, can't, I, can't. I found it really hard. Like I've, I've, my patience, because for me, you've always been dependable, young, like mum that's like got it all together and just like you know I can rock up at the house and like oh mum and then all of a sudden things have been harder and I've I've not I found it difficult because I'm like well you were only you're only in your 50s yeah do you know what I mean and and this is something that yeah but and (laughs) do you know what I'm saying is this is kind of why I wanted to have this conversation because it's made me look at things differently and think, hold on a minute, if I'd have known more about what my mum was going to experience, what things can happen to you, then I would have been much more compassionate and empathetic. And it, you, do you know what I'm saying? Mm. It's like, so just explain a little bit more about it. Like, what, what, what is it like? What's, what's happened? Do you think there should be more education? Just go, Debs. <laughs> yeah, I do really. I mean, to be fair... Like, you know, you you know, as a woman, you know, people talk, your friends talk, you know, some of your friends, you know, you like your late 40s and some of your friends who have crossed over into the 50s, oh, I've gone down the mess, I'm getting hot sweats, all this business. So you start to sort of think about it as you're approaching 50, mm. although there are a lot of ladies who do start that a lot earlier, but in general. Um, so, of course, I goes over the, the 50 bracket and I'm thinking, oh, well, I'm okay, you know, I haven't got any hot sweats, I'm all right, maybe I'll pass by people are all different but then I started noticing other things different like you know like you say I can't can't see anymore I can't see anything (laughs) that's horrific when you turn into your own mum looking for glasses Uh, where's my readers all that business that's awful because you just don't think you'll ever need glasses she's laughing but you know that will be you in 10 years Natalie think on (laughs) <laughs> anyway, so that's that's one thing that changes. Then you do start getting all these silly little aches and pains, which, you know, again, you're thinking, oh, my back's aching a bit. And you start to feel a bit like an hypochondriac because everything, <laughs> you do, you really, she's laughing here. But then the worst thing for me, if I'm honest, I start forgetting things. Now, that is when I did really go need to visit the doctor, when I started to forget and I really didn't know what that was about. I thought, well, I can't remember things. Um you know, and I've got a really good memory, Natalie. You know I have. I can yeah, remember right she from can being remember everything, everything from when I was like a baby. <laughs> well, four. Um, yeah, and so that really bothered me, especially in my work. Mm. When I have to know things, I have to know ingredients, I have to know how something's going to perform for somebody. And I'd find myself, you know, explaining about a product and saying, now this is, um, yeah, right, I'm a blank, completely blank. And that really bothered me because I did start to think, oh, my God, what's wrong? I can't remember stuff. Um, and I didn't know, I didn't know then that that is one of the symptoms of the menopause is that you get mm. forgetful or what they call baby brain. Yeah. And again, it's all hormone related. And the, one of the worst things is, um, you know, you still go through those same symptoms that you would do normally every month, but, you know, without sort of like your your menstrual cycle but you still go through those symptoms of feeling a bit up and down feeling a bit emotional if that if that's the way you used to be so you still get those kind of symptoms but without the other part Mm. but then you get all these additional things like aches pains like you say headaches mood swings yeah it's awful really Um, do you think though um that it should education around this should begin a lot earlier because for me I personally think that when you get to 35 because perimenopause can start you know a good 10 years before women in their 40s are starting Mm. you know going to the perimenopause and then pre and then going into the menopause I personally feel like if you'd have had more information surrounding it in your 40s do you think you would have dealt with it better and I think the people in your age group Natalie will probably will benefit more from things like that Education. because as I say in my in my sort of era the people my friends my peers you know we we kind of oh it's a bit of a joke you'll get the hot flush and that's what that was it really stopped at that mm. 
that's what you expected. And if you didn't get the hot flush, you were like, oh, maybe I haven't started yet. And you probably have. You've just got all different symptoms. Um, so, yeah, I do actually think that younger women should be more prepared, least really, because especially, I mean, I'm not in a relationship, but, you know, there's lots of people who are, and it does affect mm. relationships. You know, you're not just being moody. You're not just being impatient or intolerant. Well, this is what I mean. Even our relationship has yeah. been tested massively. Like the times that, you know, we've had fallouts, not massive ones, but we've had fallouts mm. because you've been sensitive to what I've said I don't understand why and I'm mm. like I didn't really say anything you've been upset by it then I've been impatient but it's because I didn't have any clue like it's yeah. not what I was expecting from my mum yeah. I wasn't ex I was expecting as you said oh she'll get some hot flushes and yeah. you know might not be able to sleep a bit but I wasn't prepared for what you were actually going to go through I wasn't prepared for the like I said for you know your eyesight or your memory there's a lot yeah like you say there's lots and lots of different symptoms of the menopause so yeah I do think people should be more educated and more aware because again then you would be more tolerant not mm. just like you know woman to woman but your male to woman yeah, relationships. Yeah, partners yeah absolutely because you know again tensions that can be created at home because you're going through something and it's like, oh, for God's sake, or ridiculed a little bit, like, mm. oh, is it that time? You know, that kind of thing. Oh, it's the menopause. That kind of, You know, people looking out the corner of their eye. It's not fair because it really does kind of change your life. I mean, people keep telling me you, you come through at the end of the tunnel, but I'm thinking, well, where's the end of the tunnel? <laughs> How old do I have to be? <laughs> you know, I'm thinking, well, when is it over yet? <laughs> Am I done? But yeah, so yeah, just get on with it, to be honest. You, you know, you start, like with anything, you live with it. it yeah, yeah, but again, I, I think it's really good that people are, you know, in the workplace starting to um, take it more seriously. Channel 4 have brought in this um, amazing initiative to support women in work through the menopause. Because I've met a few women who, you know, got into their 50s and basically have ended up leaving their jobs because they've been made to feel incompetent. They've been made to feel silly and and you know if they've had to ask for time off for something mm. then it's made them feel stupid and it's actually made them feel really bad about themselves and and where like you've just said then where's the end where's the light at the end of the tunnel um for me personally i i've said this to you anyway you know in private but i would like to see it just you know in the same way as pregnancy because we all know about that yeah you, you know, do you all know what happens at the beginning yeah. in the middle and the end we don't really know anything to be honest mm. Um, even, you know, your alternative therapies, you know, you don't really know what's the best way to go. Do you have HRT? Do you not have HRT? How does it affect you? Does it affect you worse? You know, there's lots of reasons people don't want you to have it. But then if it's a really affecting your day to day living, you know, I've actually gone on to HRT purely because I can't think. Mm. That is the one reason that regulates my hormones to put my baby brain at the back of the room and I can think again. Well, I feel good now that you've told me that because I'll prepare myself for it. Yeah, it's awful, Natalie. If when, you, when you're when you used to being a person who is totally switched on, who can remember everything, who can... My friends have always said to me, oh my God, Debs, you can remember everything, conversation, word for word, and I can normally. But without this, I swear to God, I'm standing there and I'm thinking, what were I going to say? I'll put in... Stupid things like putting the sugar in the fridge, in the yes. daft stuff. Yeah. Do you think that as well that makes you feel old, and then that makes that changes the way you see yourself? Well, I never actually put that to the menopause. I genuinely, but I did start to think about with senility and things like that. Oh, dementia. I'm thinking, oh, hang on, what's going on here? Why can't I remember anything? Mm. Um, yeah, you do. You do have those little worries, and that's what made me think. No, I will have to go see the doctor and ask him. Well, you do a lot of that reading up on Google as well. That's a that's a nightmare. Yeah, just get off Google. Doctor Google. Yeah, get off there, Mum. I keep telling you that. Um, something else I wanted to talk to you about as well was um, you became single in your forties, um, which was quite a torrid time. It was, yeah. you know, when it, let's not beat around the bush for both of us um, at that time, but particularly becoming single at that age how I remember it being so stressful and so upsetting and just everything being thrown up in the air and you know it just been an incredibly difficult time how how was that I mean how like this is the most probably frank conversation we've had about it but how genuinely was that when you found yourself on your own 
Well, uh, to be honest, Natalie, if 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 I'm really honest, I mean, it, it the first time I've been on my own, well, because I was on my own when I had you, really, mm. after a few years with your dad, um, when we broke up, I stayed on my own for a little while, as in for financial support on, mm. on my own. Um, so obviously after I was married and my marriage broke down, at sort of like 39, 40. I mean, the worst part about it is, oh, my God, I've got to start again on my own, as in... If I'm honest, more from a financial point of view than a point of view of, oh, I ain't got a lover or, you know, I ain't got a partner. That didn't really bother me too much. It was more about getting myself self-sufficient again and knowing what I'm doing with everything again. Um, and then sort of, you know, thinking about partners or going out there and meeting somebody else. I'm, I would never say never. You know, I'm right old-fashioned that way. I do think, you know, love will prevail. But equally over the years, I've grown to feel that, I don't necessarily need to be in a couple to be me, if that makes sense. People yeah, say yeah. to me all the time, oh, Debs, you know, why ain't you met somebody and this and that? But I just think, you know, I'm a great believer in fate and I think I'm happy in my own little world. I've got the people who I love are there. I've got everything I need. I've got some great friends. I've got a couple of male friends who are my friends. If I want to go out for dinner, I can do that. That's lovely. Um, and so, yeah, it doesn't really bother me being single. But at that time, though, do you think that did you ever have like a crisis of confidence, you know, in in your mid 40s about who you were, where you were going? Because there'll be lots of women in their 40s kind of thinking if they are, you know, recently separated or whatever. How how did you I, I look at think yourself? It depends on who you are as a person, mm. genuinely. Um, if you are the type of person who needs company, who feels whole as being a part of a couple and there are lots of people like that they actually need to be with somebody because it makes them feel who they are then there's the other people who think well they're not really that bothered I think it does depend on the individual person mm -hmm. um for me personally no I didn't think oh I'm left on the shelf and I'm never going to find love ever again and you know I think again it depends I know what I would bring to the table so to speak I know what my qualities are um as a person as a human being and I think you know I'm quite confident with that so if I was to meet somebody like mine did I think we would gel really quickly and great and then if we resulted as a couple that would be great but equally I wouldn't be that fussed if I didn't mm -hmm. because I'm happy with who I am I think that's the key really is to to know your own self-worth um and as far as being self-confident goes, yeah, if you're confident in who you are as a person, as a human being, I think, well, what's not to like? I think then becoming single or not single is a choice rather mm -hmm. than a, am I going to be on my own forever type of thing. So in terms of um, like your place then um, in the world, because I was obviously off at drama school university and you were and all of a sudden our house went from being this oh god yeah that were off that's what i mean so our house went from being like this <clears throat> bubbly fun family place to just you on your own um yeah that took some adapting if i'm honest because that's not about me being in a partnership with somebody yeah. that's more than that i've come from a family of you know two brothers a sister mum and dad so six of us in a house always something going on you know around our neighbors you know we're always in somebody else's house waiting for our tea uh you know wherever you were when i were a child if the tea was on you'd, you'd get tea you know around at mrs carver's or mrs starville's or wherever you know you'd have your tea and, and, and so we were brought up with that mentality of you feed one you feed all so i my household was exactly the same you know when you were a little mm. whoever was there if you were cooking you cooked for everybody so very family orientated so you're absolutely right natalie in that respect that even though there was only uh, you know the me and paul and you uh it's still uh, lots of people visited we were always cooking so the saddest thing for me was walking around Morrison's buying meal for one. Yeah. That really was like, oh, my God, is this what my life's come to? And that was nothing to do with being in a partnership as my family unit had mm. gone. Um, yeah, that that was hard. I suddenly felt like a, a, a really old lady. This is what it must be like to be in your 80s shopping for one. And that went on for a little while, if I'm honest. I was going to say, because for us, like, that is... Um I, I remember having this conversation with you where I was like, again, another, oh God, I'm such an awful daughter. One of the other times I was like impatient and then it dawned on me, I thought, hold on a minute, my mum's never been on her own. 
like I'd been on my own. I went and lived at uni and yeah, I, I shared with my friends, but I'd still been on my own mm. without my family around me and had to survive kind of, you know, in your own environment as, a, as an individual. And then I suddenly thought, my mum's never done that. Even from being, even though she's been my mum, it was always me and you together mm. you know or you and and grandma and my uncles and aunties or you and um my stepdad and then suddenly just you yeah that was hard but but again not from the point of view of i've got no partner as such boyfriend yeah. husband whatever it's the fa- it was the household the silence in the house uh, that was really difficult and i did go through that difficult patch of thinking oh my god what's my job yeah do you remember when you first met james your husband and i'm thinking well natalie's got james now you know everybody's with somebody i'm just here in my house and it's three bedrooms <laughs> no noise spotlessly clean um, and in the beginning that was really really hard um and but then it started becoming home from home for other people because it was like well i've got a big house i might as well have all my friends to come over and stay so it very much became that kind of a sociable hub where my friends could come over and stay over um, and gradually built my life back up to that. Got myself a little dog, Daisy. Love and then, Daisy. And then the most important oh. thing, and then Freddie. And then so little Fred came How along. did you feel about becoming a nana? Loved it. Can't tell Cause you. Because you were a young nana, because of oh obviously the age difference God. between us. Absolutely. Uh, without being awful, Natalie, apart from having you, obviously, is that, well, anybody who knows me will probably get sick of me twittering on about Freddie all the time because that's all I talk about, Freddie, 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 because he's just wonderful. And being a nana, it's just wonderful. And people say that because they go, oh, when you're a grandma or a nana, you get to spend more time with your grandchildren than you did with your own children. And I find that to be true, really, because going back to that mum guilt, mm. the things that, you know, I wanted the best for you, Natalie. I wanted you to not miss out on things, but... Really, as you get older, you do learn so much. It's a quality time. It's that time. You can't you can't get that back. It's the one thing you can't get back. So, you know, being able to spend that quality time and tell little stories to your grandchildren, yeah, it's lovely. I love it. Um, obviously, at the minute, we're in very difficult and uncertain times, um, and it is stressful. And, you know, I've I've rang you up being worried and, you know, being nervous about things. You've always been so resourceful and practical in a crisis. Always. You think? <laughs> yeah, always. And I don't know how you do it because you are literally like the calmest person. When the waters are so choppy, you are there like head on the ship. Here we go. Here we go. Buckle up. And, you know, we're going to have to do that now. What what would you, what's your advice for now for like going through these next difficult few months well do you know what i just think i think first of all we all have to look at ourselves and reflect selfishness can't come into it it isn't about me you it's about us it's about people in general and i think that's one thing that i really struggle with is selfishness um you know people who just start out for themselves thinking about just myself me 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 all this business it really gets on my nerves to be honest i think we should think you know there's always somebody worse off than us always you know in every walk of life everything you know people all people in australia right now you know we're all going oh, we've got this going on and we can't get to the shop for a loaf of bread and you know People in Australia haven't got a house to have a loaf of bread in because they've just had all these fires and things like that. You know, there's people in our own country that have just... I mean, I spoke to a lady last week and a gentleman who had the most beautiful property and they're now living in temporary accommodation because they got flooded. So even though coronavirus is dominating the headlines at the minute and everybody is worrying about lockdown and this and that, there are an awful lot of people who are already going through their own personal traumas that have been going through that every day ongoing anyway. So I just think we need to stop and think about the decisions we make, the attitudes we carry, you know, is it important? Is it really important in the bigger picture? Do I need to do this? You know, if you go into the shops, you think, oh, I'm buying 50 packets of toilet paper. Do I need to buy 50? Or shall I buy 50, keep one and give the other 49 to the old people around me? because they might not have anybody to go shopping for them. Just things like that, really. You know, it's not, with all due respect, hopefully, it's not the end of the world. Mm. It's not, is it? And I just think, be realistic and 
you know we, the one we, thing the one relatively if you can call it good the one thing is is we are all in this together you yeah, know like you are. said it's not just this is happening to one person it's happening to all of us so if we all come together hopefully i think that's what we need to do we need to understand each and every person that you know who's standing to either side of us and have a little bit of patience and have a little bit of tolerance and you know, have a little bit of compassion for people who are less able than us. Or, as I say, people who are already sick. Mm. You know, it's not like the whole world has suddenly gone down sick with coronavirus. We've got an awful lot of people who are already sick. And, our, you know, na National Health is already working at the, you know, the top of the thing to look after those people, never mind the people who are becoming ill. You know, this is life, it goes on every day. And, and I just think, you know, we need to all work together with it, really. I do. Um, and so that's what I would say, you know, yeah, just get what you need, do a lot of home cooking, get some food, get a big pan of stew on. <laughs> All round to Deb's. <laughs> yeah, get a big pan of stew She'll on. She'll be thrilled with that. Get your Tupperware out, put it in, put it in your freezer. There, there we are. You see, we've got it there. You see, that's what I, that's what I was going to say is like make the dinners for tonight and then keep it in the freezer and then for another day. Do you know what I always say, Natalie, I'm not being funny. I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but... You know, if we're all in jungle, we'd be on rice and beans. <laughs> so. Why are you allowed to say that? Well, I don't know. <laughs> but that's what I say to everybody. They go, oh, we haven't got this and we haven't got that. I've got tea bags. I haven't got salt. Well, if you were in jungle, you'd have rice and beans. Wouldn't you? Or fish eyes. So get on with it. And there you have it, everybody. That is it. The wise words of Debs. Um, well, Mum, we've run out of time for today. And um, I know there's, there's, to be honest, there's so much that we could have just carried on talking about. We've barely scratched the surface. Um, I hope it was less scary than what you were expecting oh my god yeah <laughs> we should have you come back on uh, series two as our agony and you're gonna you want to do that it depends what you're going to ask me about. <laughs> she no, will. I would be quite good at that, I no. think. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, well, thank you too to all of you at home for listening in today. And throughout the series, we've had the best time and met some of the most incredible guests. Thank you to each and every one of them that's taken the time to come and see us. You were all absolutely brilliant. We will be back, hopefully, sometime after Easter with more fabulous guests to keep our conversation going. But in the meantime, as always, Ways you can catch up with all of our regular content at the Capsule website www.thecapsule.co.uk and across all of our social channels. You can also listen to our previous In Conversation episodes by subscribing to any of our podcast channels. Please do leave us your rates and reviews too, as we honestly do love hearing from you. For today, though, and for this series, all that's left for us is to say, have a lovely Mother's Day. Please stay safe and goodbye so it's goodbye from Debs goodbye everyone and goodbye from me